So I'm hoping for the next 40 minutes or so, you can indulge me in a little hobby project of mine. I've had this idea boiling around in my head for probably nearly 20 years actually, about how to create a simulation that covers planets, stars, economies, trading, warfare, colonization, and galactic conquest, and all those nerdy kind of things. I'm gonna take you on a little journey through some of the things I've discovered. But when it comes down to it, this talks about creating complex results from simple rules. This little dude is a glider. The glider comes from John Conway's Game of Life. Conway invented life in 1970. He was interested in how to create self-replicating systems. To that end, he achieved his goal remarkably well. Life is Turing complete. You can create any computational system you want using life and enough patience. Life is a class of sim we call cellular autonomous. That means it simulates cellular life automatically. Life is played on an infinite grid. Every cell in the grid, every square in the grid, represents a cell. A cell can either be alive or dead. Every turn or tick of the sim, a, life's, a cell's immediate neighbors are examined to determine what happens to that cell in the next tick. So the rules go something like this. If a cell has zero or one neighbor, it's gonna die of loneliness. If a cell is alive and has two or three neighbors, it's gonna stay alive. If a cell is dead and it's got exactly three neighbors, it comes to life. If a cell has four or more neighbors, it dies from overcrowding. If we run life on a randomly distributed population, say 15% coverage, it's gonna look something like this. I've never seen this full size before. If you watch it for a few seconds, you can see pretty much straight away we have a bunch of different species of life. Some of them are static, some of them oscillate. Some of them repeat after a number of generations. Yes, five, nine, 11, a billion generations. There's been an enormous amount of research done into life. There've been probably multiple PhDs invested into this sim. The rules of life say nothing about marching across the screen or oscillating or repeating. All the, all the rules specify is what happens to one cell dependent on its neighbors. So what we're seeing here is called emergent behavior. The behavior we see comes from the rules, but it's not defined by them. If we look at life in higher resolution, it really does kind of look like bacteria boiling away in a petri dish. But I kind of like to look at it from another angle. You can say, this is the heat death of the universe. These regions that are boiling away are like the, the filaments of, of the universe at the gigaparsec scale. And these static regions are like the dark matter in between them. Another type of cellular autonomy is called foxes and rabbits, or rabbits and foxes. Um, it models a predator-prey relationship. Here the rabbits are in blue, the foxes are in red. Every tick, one of these guys moves around the screen basically in a drunken walk. If a rabbit meets another rabbit, it breeds, is what rabbits do. If a fox encounters a rabbit and he's hungry, he eats the rabbit. If a fox goes long enough without eating a rabbit, he starves to death. What we see here is something that pretty accurately models a real-world predator-prey population base. So the prey population will boost up, the predators will follow, they'll eat out the prey, and then the predator population will crash. Again, this is a really simple set of rules. It creates some kind of complex and almost real-world result. But we don't care about bacteria. We don't care about mammals. We want to make spaceships. So to make spaceships, you have to have a functioning economy. So here's my hacky rough attempt at making an economy for our simulation. It works something like this. You have a fixed size planet. The size of the planet is randomly generated when it's made. It has a population. The population has a birth rate and a death rate. You have some agriculture. The, the size of the population cannot exceed your agricultural output, else you're gonna to starve to death. The population works in an industry. The industry outputs some kind of productivity. We're measuring it here in credits, basically some kind of money. The industry improves your agriculture. The better the technology, the better the farming. 
but industry also makes pollution. So the pollution reduces the birth rate of your population and decreases your agricultural output. So if we're going to model a real, a real economy, it's going to look something like this. You've got a finite resource base, you're going to consume it and die out. Basically, this is what we're doing right now. But for the sim, that's not so useful. We want to create something that's more steady state and uh, at least has a little bit of oscillation to make it interesting. So once you have enough credit, you can make a spaceship. The spaceship takes some of your population, flies off to colonize other worlds. This lets the agriculture recover and the population regrows and the cycle repeats. This is our basic economy simulation. Now, this is a JavaScript conference, so we do have to do some JavaScript. Um, <laughs> um, every frame in this presentation is, is running in the browser, okay? It has two main functions. First of all, we've got a tick function. The tick function models our universe. Uh, we define our universe as a set of variables. In this case, we're modeling a bouncing ball. The ball has an altitude, it has a velocity, and we have a constant gravity. Every tick, we apply the gravity to the velocity, we apply the velocity to the altitude. When the altitude goes below zero, we reverse the velocity to simulate a bounce. And then we say, hey, JavaScript, in 25 milliseconds, do it all over again. This drives our simulation. Now, if you're going to make one of these yourself, this is the wrong way to do it. There's no guarantee that set timeout is going to be called in 25 milliseconds. It might be 26 milliseconds, 30, 50, 100 milliseconds. If JavaScript is busy doing something else, it will not call your timeout until it's ready to do it. So the right way to do this is to take a timestamp before you call your set timeout, take another one as soon as you enter your tick function, dip those two times and use that as a factor in your physics calculations. But really, I've taken the approach that sometimes good enough is good enough, and for these slides, I have not done that. The other function we have is a draw function. Uh, basically, you paint your universe onto the screen. To get smooth animation, you want to be painting it at 60 frames a second. But it's pretty rude to tell the browser to try and do that. You might have a low-powered mobile device. You may have some other computation going on. The tab you're trying to paint to might be in the background and there's no point to render to it. You're just wasting resource. So we use request animation frame. Request animation frame says, hey browser, please, when you're ready, when you want to paint the screen, call our function and we'll draw it for you. After we've painted all our stuff, we set another request animation frame callback and it'll do it again when it's ready. This lets the browser control the pace of the redraw. For the actual drawing, I'm using HTML5 Canvas. Um, HTML5 Canvas is nothing special. It's in the spec. It's supported almost everywhere. It's right up there with the P tag and the div. So you should be using it in your daily work, OK? It's nothing special. I'm using two layers for my rendering. I have a layer in the front where I paint my universe. And behind it, I have what I call the effects layer. I just draw a, a copy of those things I paint in the front, or maybe a variation of them, and then apply some kind of modification to it. In this case, I want to achieve a fade back and a slide. So I paint a very slightly opaque black rectangle over the effects layer, and every frame that fades my layer back. Canvas also lets you snapshot a region of pixels. So I snapshot the whole canvas, paste it slightly over to one side, and over time that slides the image across. So the same catch applies to this as to the tick function. You should be doing a time difference to make sure these are accurately controlled. Again, for this preso, I have not done that. The other thing that's pretty handy with Canvas is Canvas transforms. So Canvas gives us an arbitrary grid to draw stuff on. We have an origin that's in the top left. We can draw anywhere on it. Now, if you're trying to draw primitive objects, maybe the same object again and again and again, you do not want to calculate the positions of all of these objects, because they, they might have multiple points in them, right? It's a lot of math. So we use Canvas transforms to get around that. If I wanted to draw a rectangle on the screen, I could say draw an image that's two pixels wide and four pixels high. Now, if I do a translate first, say I go width divided by two and height divided by two, the origin of my screen becomes the center instead of the top left. So now if I draw this, I can go draw minus one pixel, plus one pixel, minus two pixels, plus two pixels. I have a rectangle in the center of the screen. And if I do a scale before I draw that, say 200 times, I can have it 200 pixels wide and 400 pixels high. But when I'm drawing my actual shape, I can still think in terms of, of individual units. It makes the, the, the calculation to, to draw your shapes much easier. Now, rotation works in a similar way. It just rotates it before it paints it. So you can paint it in any angle you want without really having to do much math. When you do these transforms, 
you really want to be wrapping them in the save restore. So when I do a transform, if I save it first, say my origin's in 0, 0, I do my transform and paint some stuff and go restore, my origin will go back to how it was before I did the first bunch of transforms. You're normally going to want to wrap each primitive in a save restore. That's the JavaScript done. And now we're going to do the math. Um, if you want to do gravity and spaceships and planets, or if you want to do spaceships and planets, you've got to do gravity, right? Gravity is pretty easy. It's just uh, a function on a distance between two things. You probably want to work the mass of those things in there. I'm not doing that. I'm just using a, a fudge factor to kind of make it look all right. If you want to work out the distance between two objects, well, how do we do that? All our objects are on a Cartesian plane. We have an x, y value for each of them. We just subtract the x's and the y's from each other. We square them, we add them together, take the square root. It's just Pythagoras theorem. That's the distance between the two objects. We can apply a gravity function to that to get a kind of magnitude for the force of the gravity. And we need to translate that to a, an x, y change for our object's position. How do we do that? We need to work out the angle between the two objects so we can do some trig on them. So we use the arc tangent, which is basically taking the x and the y and giving us that angle. Math.a tan 2, y comma x. Now we have an angle, we have a magnitude. Uh, to get the x and the y, it's pretty easy. We, we take the cosine of the angle, multiply it by gravity, that's the x change. We take the sine of the angle, multiply it by gravity, and that's the y change. What I recommend you do is go to Wikipedia, look it up, write a little library, put it in a file somewhere, and forget about it. You never have to do it again. So once we've got some basic gravity, we can do this. We can have an object flying around a mass. Now, if we just have gravity, this thing's going to fly to the center of the object and basically wobble around its center. It's pretty boring. So what we do is take our angle, add 90 degrees to it, and make another little vector. That kicks it out from the center of the planet, so it creates a slingshot effect. You can see three lines here. The big long line shows us the direction of the gravity vector. There's a short line, that's our little kick out vector. We add the two together and get that medium length line, which is the actual velocity of our object. Making planets is quite a bit easier. We call these heliocentric orbits. We have a star, Helios, and some things rotating around it. Each of these only has three variables. We have a radius, how far from the star it is. We have an orbital position, how far around the star it is. And we have an orbital velocity, which is how fast it's moving. Every tick, we just add the velocity to the orbital position, use the same math to work out where on the screen to draw it. The shadows are just a semicircle. We just add 90 or 180 degrees or something like that and draw our semicircle. Once we've got these, of course, we would want to put them together. So these purple lines show us the gravity vectors. And you can see how many lines of force are on each little comedy spaceship thing. We've only really got one rule here. We've got some gravity. But you can see some really kind of beautiful organic behavior happening almost by itself. You can see planets steal the moons from other planets. Sometimes when the planets line up in a line, you see some really extreme behavior going on. We can reload it. This randomly generates it each time. We'll just look at it a bit, OK? It's worth looking at. You also see some really strange behavior. That guy out the left is caught between the two planets, and he's just hovering there. All right. So down on these planets, we have a population. Planets are populated by Boyds. And Boyds are not my original creation. A guy called Craig Reynolds invented Boyds in 1986. Now, did some research into Mr. Reynolds. Turns out he has a history. Craig worked on the original Tron movie, which came out in 1982. Tron is a groundbreaking computer graphics movie. We're talking about the original Tron, not the new one. If you have not seen Tron, you owe it to yourself to watch it. It's a groundbreaking computer graphics movie, but it's also a groundbreaking computer culture movie. We are part of that culture. Please take some time to watch it. Boyds have two properties. They have a velocity. They're all born with a unique velocity. And they have the angle they're facing. Boyds have three rules. Boyds don't want to be too close to their neighbors. If they fly too close, they're going to veer that angle away from the neighbor. They also want to fly in the same direction. So they look at their immediate neighbors within a certain radius and turn their angle towards the average of the direction of all of their neighbors. They also want to fly to the same place. 
So they look at the average position of all their immediate neighbours and turn towards that place. There's only three rules and two properties, okay? But you see some really, I mean, this looks organic, right? It looks like real birds or fish behaving in nature. There's also a little bit of nice emergent behaviour here. Sometimes you see a few of them will go off the side of the screen and re-emerge on the other side. I think you're about to see it now. The ones who haven't made it off the side of the screen are going to turn around and meet their friends. You can see it happening right now. And the rules say nothing about this. This behaviour just comes from the rules. So we can put a cat amongst the pigeons. We have a couple of predators. The predators only have one rule. They want to fly towards the centre of the mass of all of the boys. The boys have another rule. When a predator comes too close, they want to get the heck out of dodge. They just turn away from the predator. Now, I think you could do a really good version of foxes and rabbits using this. Maybe the predators just pick out one victim and chase them down. And <laughs> But again, I just actually want to watch this because I think it's so beautiful. It looks like sharks circling in the ocean. And it looks amazing, right? Fast forward three million years. The boys have evolved. They have lasers. They have missiles. They have defensive shields. They hate each other. <laughs> what you can't see here is that the ships have different energy to each other. Even though the energy bars are the same, they're born with a random amount of energy. <laughs> they heal damage, but the ability to heal damage is also damaged with the more hits you take. So eventually you are going to die. The lasers are not always accurate. Every ship is born with a random set of characteristics. Best of five? Yeah. Come on, pink, you can, come on, blue, you can do it. <laughs> oh, no. We'll give him, he's got to have one, right? First the one. <laughs> oh, I give up. It's not a loaded game. Right, so once we've made a few of these guys, what do we want to do? We want to put them in a fish tank and see what they do to each other. This is the original fighting ships experiment. So this is really the, the seed for deep space. Now this thing has bugs in it. I've left the bugs in there because it's quirky and cute, and I really didn't want to destroy the original magic of the game. Now the more powerful ships chase the weaker ships. The weaker ships run away from the more powerful ships. The problem is they go to the side of the screen and try to keep running. There's nothing to motivate them to get back into the centre. But I left it in there because I, I really like it and I did not want to kind of damage this bit of the sim. Come on, guys. You also see the missiles are a bit quirky. They just change direction at random. But what I really like is that little bit of slingshot they get around the planets. I reckon if they weren't trying to kill each other, they'd just be like flying around these planets going, woohoo! Okay. So I think we've got all the bits we need. Let's start the journey. This is a random star system generator. So I can just keep making star systems all day. Right? Each of these systems has a basic post industrial economy much like ours. They're sitting there consuming stuff, working in their factories, polluting the crap out of their planet, doing what civilizations do. But they're not spaceflight capable. These stars are actually color accurate according to Wikipedia. Right? So as the stars change, yeah, I'm not sure about the sizes. We can put in a test mode and make these planets spawn some ships. So the governments on the colored planets are motivated to have Three ships in the system at all time. Launch it again, they've got no ships. I want to make three ships. I've got three ships, that's enough. The ships are motivated to chase the enemy. The big ones will chase the small ones, the weaker ones will run away from the more powerful ones. The ones of the same colour are motivated to separate each other. And this is kind of running in a test mode, we turn the guns off, we just want to make sure our physics is right. But again, we can just keep making these things all day long. The ships are affected by the gravity. The planets rotate around, so the flight paths are always changing based on the placement of the planets. The sun affects them as well. We can bring the noise a bit. So each government wants to have two ships. Those missiles are going to hold it more powerful. 
missile takes about one hit and then a couple more laser blasts and you're dead. What I like about this is it's faster than any human could play an arcade game. You know, if you play this, you are going to lose. When drone warfare hits the mainstream, this is what it's going to be like. It's going to be over before it started. We can bring the noise a bit more and make each planet have 10 ships. It's kind of cool. JavaScript is dealing with this, right? It's JavaScript in the browser has got like 100 objects in play. No drama. This is heavily unoptimized code. I can knock it back down to two ships. These stragglers will die off. Let's boost it up again. It's worth watching. OK, this is test mode stuff, right? We're just making sure things work. But what we want to do is take over other planets. So we just put a government in our star system, and something like this happens. You have an economy. It makes a spaceship. It loads some population onto the spaceship. The spaceship flies off in search of new worlds. It finds a new world. It kills the locals. It puts its population onto the planet, takes over the economy, and starts making more spaceships. Let's do it quickly. Make a spaceship, load your population, fly to another world, kill the locals, take over. Square box means you're killing the locals. Kill the locals. Help your friend. It's our planet. And once you own the whole system, your ships fly into garrison patrol around the space, just in case the bad guys show up. All right, do you want to watch it again? Let's do it again. Make a spaceship. Colonize. Colonize. Kill the locals. <laughs> My system. <laughs> All right, so of course, now we need two governments. Let's have some war. So this really comes down to who, who, um, who makes the spaceships the fastest. Now, if the enemy has some ships in orbit, I always want to have one more ship than my enemy. Right? So I want X plus one ships. Now, if I have X plus two ships, that extra ship is free to go and colonize a planet. Right? That means my buddies can stay up there fighting the war, you know, controlling the airspace, while I take care of the land war. In this case, I think pink is probably going to have it. It's a pink system. Let's try it again. Now, these guys, the production is a bit more even. That pink guy landed and took off straight away again because his government didn't have enough air power. They're making a play for the pink homeworld. Now, this is unusual. Normally this plays out really fast. It's just a matter of seconds and, and it's over. I was kind of surprised at that. I made no assumptions as to what was going to happen, but I thought it might go in a bit longer. Let's see if yellow makes a comeback, eh? I think, well, here we go. This is really unusual. Normally it's like 15 seconds, it's all over. Making a play for the yellow homeworld. History. OK, so we can do this. Let's bump up the number of systems. We can try it with seven systems. Now, there's another rule in play here. When you own a system and you have some ships in garrison, your ships can hyperspace to another system. The ships follow a rule like this. <laughs> First, they'll go for a completely unknown system and try and colonize it. Then they'll go somewhere their buddies are and try and help their buddies. Then they'll go for a mixed system, maybe somewhere there's a bit of a skirmish going on. Finally, they're going to try and go for one that's wholly owned by the enemy. This is their order of priority for deciding where to hyperspace. But what got me about this is our systems play out really fast, right? It's 30 seconds, it's all over. This can go on for 10 minutes. It's a war of attrition. So let's see what's happening. Yellow and pink have a homeworld, blue has two. Blue's making a play for the center. Now the center, center system is pretty strategic. It's really vulnerable, you can be attacked from all sides, but it's also the gateway to the whole sector. Depending where your enemies start, you can have an advantage. In this case, blue definitely has an advantage because pink and yellow are going to be scrapping it out while blue is free to conquer the rest of the sector.
Blue's nearly got three. Blue's making a play for the center. Like I said, this will go on for 10 minutes. We'll just watch it for a bit, okay? <laughs> How much I got left? <laughs> right. Blue's pretty much got three systems. Here it goes. Must be a big population on that planet. They haven't managed to kill them all yet. I could load another one and try again. But life is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> right, yellow's pretty much got its system. It's going to start branching out. Blue's lagging. Pink's got its system. Blue's got first, uh, yellow's got first mover advantage. Yellow's nearly got the center system. They have the gateway to the sector. Purple's making a play for it. And I think blue is about to get smashed. <laughs> still, it's not bad for JavaScript in the browser, right? It's, it's almost dealing with it. This could go on all day. We can have a look at it later. <laughs> so when I first conceived of deep space, I thought it would look something like this. You're going to have a star field of tens of thousands of stars, maybe some kind of pinch zoom interface so you can zoom in and out of it, maybe even down to the planetary level. Um, I was going to be more focused on trading. So your economies are going to have deficits and surpluses of different resources. The ships are going to go out and buy and sell and bring stuff back to their planets. But I pretty quickly realized I was going to have to make a fully functioning stock market and an algo trading system, so that was not going to happen in time for the conference. <laughs> um, but I think more interesting is that I'd like to get it out of the browser and running in, on a server. Or once you've got, say, 50 or 100 systems running on a the server, there's nothing stopping you having many servers. I mean, you, you could have a galaxy of 100,000 or a million systems all in play. That I would really like to see. What kind of behavior are we going to see emerge from this? What's kind of trading going to do to it? Can we, have, can we have some kind of diplomacy between the governments? What does a small tweak to the rules do to the system? How does warfare play out? I don't know. I think that's probably something for another talk. So that's really all I've got to say about deep space. Um, I hope you got something from it. And thanks for listening to my talk. There's so many things going through my mind. Interstellar, C5, Rosetta Comet Chaser. <laughs> Seriously, I'm sure we have questions. Fascinating simulation and graphics. It's all done in the browser with JavaScript. Fascinating. Don't be shy, people. Yeah. Yellow one in the end, by the way. It's all over. So we You're all going to die. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We went from type 0 to type 3 civilization scale Ooh. in the card card scale. Yeah. yeah, type 3. Yeah. Type 3, yeah. yeah. Colonize your entire galaxy. All right, I'll, I'll get there, Thomas. Okay. That was really interesting. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, notice all your simulations are war-based. Is there any reason that it's all conflict and there couldn't be any other types of simulations? Yeah, okay, I'm a boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I, I got caught up in sci-fi role-playing a bit when I was younger, the pen and paper stuff, and this is really an extension of that. But to tell you the truth, the trading, the trading concept was the original concept. And I'm, I'm almost more interested in how that can be done. I think it's a whole lot more complex. You can get into things like um, the speed of communication. I mean, we can't communicate faster than the speed of light, right? So the speed the ships travel actually becomes a limiting factor in your communication. So how does that affect the gameplay? But it's easier to make ships fight each other than to do a trading system, and it's probably also more fun to watch. Else it's just numbers on a screen. Cool. Definitely another simulation with trading one day. Yeah. <laughs> another uh, question. Yes. We'll, we'll get... Um, Thomas, you want to get Charlie first, and then I'll get you? Yeah. 
Um, you, you mentioned that you haven't done any work on optimizing it yet, and it's, it's, it's our, you're already running up against some bottlenecks, it seems like. Are you, are you planning to devote time towards optimization? Are you considering maybe using another language, or do you think JavaScript really is going to be able to realize your entire vision? Yeah, I think the, um, the most important bit is actually the, the modeling. The rendering is, to me, is kind of secondary in a way. Um, so th to me, there's no real limit in the, for the modeling. It's just the real-time presentation. And I think as you get bigger, it's funny, you probably notice, is, as you look at the smaller ones, it's kind of more exciting, right? But when you step out from it, it starts looking more boring in a way. So the rendering becomes less and less important the bigger your simulation becomes. And if I was going to do the multi-server thing, uh, basically each server is capable of dealing with a, a single stream. And maybe you could even actually just render it locally on the server and stream it out as video or something uh, to get over that. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Th that is a really awesome uh, demonstration of game theory from my point of view. Thank and you. I feel that um, it's kind of a virtual reality, uh, a virtual universe that you created based on some uh, principles that you define. So um, actually, I have a question. I want to ask your opinion about uh, the definition of intelligence uh, recently by one of the, I, I saw you on a TED talk. Uh, he defines intelligence in an algorithm by saying that an algorithm, um, uh, if, okay, uh, in terms of an agent and game theory, uh, in a game where an agent wants to have a future uh, of a higher possibility, and that is his definition of intelligence in uh, a universe. Right? So what's your opinion about this definition? That's a good question. Um, I think something that appears intelligent is intelligent. Um, th these things are not very smart, but they, they kind of look organic and alive. And maybe there's not a defining line that says this is intelligent and this is not. I think it's some kind of continuum. I mean, uh, is a dog intelligent? Or a, a goldfish? Um, I'm not sure. Challenging. Uh, one last question. Maybe from that side of the room, someone? Or anywhere else? All right, here once again. Um, can we try playing with any of your code? Sure. Uh, simonswain.com slash deep space. It's up there now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon.